Hi, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Uh, I'm Sarah Posner, uh, Senior Editor of Legion Dispatches, and my guest today is Sarah Pullian Bailey, who's online editor at Christianity Today. And we're going to talk about Mitt Romney and President Obama and same sex marriage and evangelicals and all that good stuff. Um, but let's start with uh, Romney's speech this weekend at his commencement speech at Liberty University. What do you think the reaction? from the evangelical community has been to the speech? So it seemed rather positive. I don't, I didn't see much that was terribly shocking from the speech itself that mm -hmm. either, um, you know, it's all about expectations, right? What were we expecting to hear and what did he deliver? And I thought, you know, it's true to expectation. And, you know, it may, I, what's unclear to me is how much it'll help him because Liberty as you know, only represents just a, one portion of evangelicals. Obviously, it's a big one. It's a big university. Right. It touches a lot of, you know, a certain segment of evangelicalism. But it's unclear to me how much it'll actually sway those who were, you know, not convinced before, whether it'll, you know, be a tipping point for them. So, right. It was, it was you... funny. Well, it was funny because the New York Times coverage referred to Liberty University as the spiritual heart of the conservative movement, which actually kind of made me laugh because it's just not, I don't think that that's an accurate no, statement. I, I about, agree with you. I, yeah. Well, and what's interesting is Michael Luo of the New York Times tweeted over the weekend, you know, and he made the point, Liberty is just one of many Christian colleges. And if you wanted a an at more accurate sampling of evangelical colleges, you would need to look at, you know, Wheaton, Calvin, Baylor, Westmont. I mean, there are so many other colleges that are not like Liberty in right. their, you know, in their student conduct in their, what their expectations in the way they teach science and things like that. That's right. I mean, there's, and there's just countless Bible colleges and, um, seminaries all over the you know, evangelical seminaries all over the country and and liberty is just a small slice of that and I think it has the notoriety because of being founded by Jerry Falwell obviously but yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> but I think it's sort of de rigueur for Republican candidates now to go and give a speech there uh, the other candidates during the primary gave speeches there uh, Rick Perry did, and Michelle Bachman mm -hmm. did, at yeah. least. Did anybody else? I don't remember. I'm, I, Those I remember are the Michelle... ones I remember. Maybe, I know Huckabee's, right? Huckabee Huckabee's. has, right, right. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, you know, Michelle Bachman's speech that she gave during the primaries, to me, was much more infused with evangelical language and imagery and uh, discussion of American exceptionalism and weaving that together with her own salvation testimony. And I thought it was an interesting, I actually was fascinated by the speech that she gave there. And I thought it was an interesting contrast to Romney's, which was much more, I thought it was just much more staid mm -hmm. and much more um, kind of safe, what you would expect. Yeah. Um, and not the other thing that he didn't do, I mean, had he gone the route that Michelle Bachman had gone, it would have seemed forced and not genuine because he's not an evangelical. Right, exactly. So, well, if I can push back just a little bit, uh -huh. I did I did think he put out, you know, he used some phrases and he mentioned some individuals, specific individuals that I think will resonate among evangelicals. And maybe those outside of evangelicalism wouldn't necessarily picked up, but he mentioned Bonhoeffer, he mentioned Chuck Colson, he mentioned, I mean, he Wilbur specifically Force. pointed out right. these individuals who, who, you know, he wasn't citing Joseph Smith or, you know, Mormon leaders. He was specifically... That would have gone over well, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, so... Right, exactly. But my point is, it, he may not have Bachman's like personal narrative and testimony, and and he won't come at it from an evangelical point of view. In fact, you know, he very distinctly said, "Different faiths, yours and mine." Like he he acknowledged that there are different faiths, but um, but I think he did, you know, make an effort to use and kind of appeal to that evangelical base. I I think that that's true, and it was interesting. I. Uh... Ed Kilgore, who writes at the Washington Monthly, had a post this morning about the speech, and he specifically talked about how he raised the names of these figures like mm -hmm. Colson and John Paul II, even mm -hmm. you know, interesting, you know, a pope, um, 
and also uh, Wilberforce and William Wilberforce and John Wesley. Did he and, mention C.S. Lewis too? I feel like and C.S. Lewis. That's right. Yeah. That was the other one. Yeah. And uh, and I think Kilgore thought that this was very subtle and but in a clever way. Yes. Uh, yeah. And I actually maybe I, I listen to you know for a non-evangelical I listen to a lot of evangelical. Yeah talk. So it didn't seem that unusual to me. Mm-hmm. I, I thought it was, yes, it was clever if what you're trying to do is reach that audience because it does um, ring bells to to hear to talk about the abolitionist William Wilberforce mm-hmm. or Chuck Colson, who passed away recently, um, and C.S. Lewis, obviously. So uh, it seemed like he sort of called, he must, he must have called in a speechwriter who knew, oh, yeah, knew some of the names to... <laughs> right. Well, I mean, I... Up. Mark DeMoss had to have a hand in that speech because there was so much the, – just the way he talked about service and the way – it was very – it just felt like somebody in it, it, an evangelical had looked over the speech and said, oh, make sure you, you know, plug this or plug that. And, and mm-hmm. the names, as we said, was one of the ways for him to say, okay, I might, may not become or ever be your evangelical leader that – maybe a Huckabee or Bachman would be, but he's able to say, but I look to C.S. Lewis and his writings, or I look to Bonhoeffer and his influence and um, in Germany and things like that to say, look, we're all on the same page. We love the same people. We may have different faiths, but, you know, we can all look to these leaders to sort of uh, guide us, if you will. So, I, you know, I thought it was subtle, clever. It may not have surprised you. It didn't surprise me, um, but it worked, you know, for what it was. So what do you think the reaction has been, um, not necessarily by Liberty students, who are obviously not the sole intended audience of, of the speech, but what do you think the reaction has been among I can tell all positive. Leaders? I mean, I have not seen anyone mm-hmm. who was like, he should have, you know, it converted from Mormonism. I don't think anyone was expecting that, <laughs> right? You know? Yeah. Right, so right. I think, again, looking so, at so, the expectations, thinking about what, what did we think he was going to say? I mean, he, he did. He I thought it was interesting. I saw some of the reporters kind of act surprised he didn't talk more about marriage. I was actually surprised mm-hmm. he even. I mean, he had to kind of nod to it. Right. But I didn't think he was going to give this yeah. like in defense of traditional marriage right in front of, you know, like these these people agree with that. They're not going to be swayed by him or it. But I thought it was interesting. He didn't play off of it more because I think one of the questions was, after Obama's, you know, announcement, we, you know, he, he could have used it to whatever his, his advantage, but he didn't, he just sort of nodded to it and moved on and, and talked about other things. So what, I mean, did you expect something different out of that? Yeah, I expected him to touch on it in some way, just because Obama, I think maybe if Obama hadn't made his announcement last week, maybe Romney wouldn't have brought it up at all. But I think after that, it raised an expectation that he would bring it up. But I think he was trying to walk this line where he wasn't really going to get way too deeply into politics, even though that's obviously the reason why he was there. Um, But I think that he probably felt like he had to say something in part because I think that there are probably still Republican voters who are maybe uncertain or unconvinced of Romney's own position. Uh, but, uh, I wasn't real, I, you know, I think that there's this conventional wisdom that, and I think it's, it's partially based in truth in, in reality that younger evangelicals just don't really want to hear that much about that. I mean, I think that it was not the sort of thing that I doubt there are very many people who really wanted to hear that at their commencement speech, you know, at the, at their commencement, that, that. Even if they agree with Romney and his position being opposed to same-sex marriage. Yeah, I mean, I, here's I the just, deal. When I, I know when I was at, I went to Wheaton College, and I know uh-huh. I know that students just wanted some big name. They didn't necessarily care who it was. Like, we had students my year pushing for President Bush to be the commencement speaker, and it wasn't like there were a lot of students who would have protested that and who would have said, you know, what he's done on the war or whatever is – you know, they, it would have been sort of a, 
a big mess probably, and that's probably why they didn't do it. But I think a lot of students are just excited to be like, hey, look, the rest of the you know country is paying attention to our school and, and you know, and sees that I'm right. graduating from this university where a presidential candidate is going to be. So, you know, the actual message, you know, maybe they would have preferred to hear from a Billy Graham type of person. But I think in general, I think that, you know, I would guess the average Liberty student as much as we heard in the media, they were, you know, some were protesting or whatever. I think they, I'm guessing the average Liberty student was just pleased that the, the university has that kind of clout to bring someone that big, you know, to their commencement. So. And that they didn't necessarily want to hear a big speech about. Right, exactly. Murder. No, and I thought his, his speech also too, when I was listening to it, I was like, oh yeah, this is a graduation. Like, you know, he's, a, he's trying to encourage them and spur them on to good works and things like that. It's not a policy call to action, vote for me. You know, it, it had to be delicately presented, I think. So I think one other thing, if I can throw out there, we had a writer, um, a, the English chair professor of liberty wrote a piece for us, and she argued that, you know, as much as some of the students may have been protesting and un annoyed by the speech, it was very much in line with Jerry Falwell's vision to work ecumenically across the board with Mormons, Catholics, do it, you know, it just across the board. He it he would have said, you know, since when did the election become about the evangelical vote? Like, since when did we let it be that way? We work across the board. We you know do. We, you know, talk to Muslims and, you know, and we find common ground either politically or in ministry or whatever in those areas. And um, and the focus on his Mormonism, I thought, was, you know, where where the media got caught up. But what Karen was trying to say was, no, this would have been all along in what Falwell would have wanted. Well, I mean, Falwell was undoubtedly, I mean, he was a political person who wanted his religious perspective uh, injected into mm -hmm. politics. And I think he didn't, he, I think there was probably a point in his life where he was less interested in doing that in an ecumenical way. As he got deeper into politics, he wanted to do it in a more ecumenical way from the standpoint, you know, sort of like the Francis Schaeffer co-belligerency yeah. kind of idea where, you know, it's like, okay, you're a Mormon. I don't care because, you know, you share my, belief that abortion should be uh, outlawed or that homosexuality should be outlawed or whatever the, the issue was. Um, but I think that because, I think that's why the liberty speeches by politicians do get so much attention because Falwell sort of considered the architect of injecting these, uh, this sort of, uh, injecting the evangelical world into mm -hmm. politics. Uh, and so, but I think like we were saying at the beginning, that's not the whole evangelical world or nor is it necessarily the, the spiritual center of the conservative right. movement. But I do think that, I mean, the, you know, I think when people were um, talking and back, even back in 2008 about Romney's Mormonism, but also during the ascendancy of, of, uh, Glenn Beck, who also once spoke yes, at a, at a Liberty he commencement, did. and he's Mormon as well, um, that Falwell was one of the early uh, folks in the religious right making uh, partnerships or political partnerships with Mormons and other other Christian, uh, and I, I consider Mormonism to be a Christian faith, you know, and other Christian faiths, and probably even Jews, um, to to form these political partnerships. So I think that 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 isn't new. But on the other hand, I guess you know there was a lot of chatter about a, a class at at Liberty that teaches that Mormonism is a cult and all of that. Yeah, so. I mean, <laughs> and you're going to hear that. Uh, in various places, and then you're going to hear some pushback from people like Rich Mao, president of Fuller Seminary, who's going to say, no, we don't describe Mormons as cults. And so, you know, it mm -hmm. just depends either what kind of evangelical you're talking to, what region of the country, how educated they are. Like, you know, all these factors uh, combine into a sense. And, sorry, one other you know, factor that you have to take into consideration is not just how they view Mormons, but how they view 
um, political activism. Is it okay to vote for somebody who doesn't share your beliefs? So, you know, since... You know, we don't have all this discussion about, like, is it okay for us to vote for a Jewish candidate, you know, or, you know, right. it's sort of like, since, you know, why is, why are we not having this conversation over here, but we are having it over here with Mormonism. I think, obviously, it's, it's new, and people are having to grapple with it, and, you know, certain people have said certain things, and it's sort of causing an uproar, but you do have pushback from people who, who are saying, well, Mormons a lot are, a lot like us in terms of social issues, uh, religious freedom across um, international religious freedom. You know, they're going to stand with us on the contraception issue or whatever. Um, whatever these other issues are, they're going to say, well, pragmatically, you know, it's better. <laughs> it wasn't it Martin Luther who said, I'd rather be ruled by, um, how did he put it? Do you know what quote I'm talking about where he's? Yeah, I do, but now I don't remember. We'll have to find that. But anyway, uh, you yeah. know, <laughs> some he'd rather be ruled by a smart, you know, non-Christian or whatever than a a stupid Christian. <laughs> I've heard, I'm horribly well, paraphrasing it, but I, you know, I think a lot of people would would resonate with that. Well, the other thing that I, having done some reporting at and about Liberty. Uh, I think that the view that all of the students there are in this lockstep culture war mentality is not accurate. Um, so I wouldn't have expected, I would have expected Romney's people to know that and therefore would not have expected Romney to do a big culture yeah. warrior-ish speech, which is not really, you know, he, I think he's letting surrogates yeah. do that. <laughs> um, but, you know, a few years ago, I was at Liberty for the first Freedom Federation conference, and this is a coalition of different religious right groups um, that, again, it was very much oriented around this broad, it didn't include Mormons, but it did have this kind of broad Christian, int intra-Christian ecumenism uh, where they talked very much about uh, erasing theological differences between them in the service of these uh, political goals. But what was really interesting was uh, campus, it's right there, at the conference was right there on campus, and what is it, ten or 15,000 students there? And there were only a handful of students who even came to any of the events, the biggest one being a kind of revival yeah. in the evening, and there were only, I would say at most, you know, a few hundred students mm -hmm. there. Um, so it was just notable to me that they, there didn't seem to be a huge amount of interest in this conference. And then the other experience I had was reporting a story about Liberty Law School and students who were unhappy about the way uh, biblical law versus man's law was being taught to them and uh, in the law school and how they were dissatisfied with being taught that if uh, quote unquote, you know, man's law conflicted with God's law that you should engage in civil disobedience and not obey um, uh, the the law of a court or the, uh, an order of a court. And this was specifically in the context of a very uh, celebrated uh, uh, custody, custody case involving a little girl who had um, two, two moms who ended up splitting up. Um, but in any case, uh, you know, I think that I, I, I do think that there's there's people who do go to students who do go to Liberty. They may not be the majority, uh, but who are actually go there from some of these law students that I talked to. It seemed like they went there and were actually turned off by um, being fed culture war stuff in the classroom. Uh, I so, mean, and you're drawing anyway. from all, all sorts of countries, you know, people from all over the world come, come, you know, missionary kids or whatever come to Liberty and they're confused or turned off. I think, I don't know if you've read Kevin Roos's book on Liberty, but I feel like there was a section in there that, you know, mentioned just sort of not everyone is in line or, you know, there are definitely internal and external struggles with the university's views on X, Y, or Z. I mean, some of it is sort of accepted or, but, uh, you know, here and there you'll find kids who are challenging it or, or just not choosing to, again, like you said, play the culture warrior um, type. So... But, you know, it's funny because, you know, so, so Romney didn't do that. But at the same time, it seems like there are culture warrior uh, generals, so to speak, 
who are coming around to backing him. Let's leave Brian Fisher out of the right, equation yes. for the moment. Yeah, we should all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but but there are other people, Tony Perkins, Gary Bauer, other figures who are sort of considered <laughs> leaders in conservative evangelicalism who are, seem to be coming around to saying, okay, like, well, Romney's doing and saying the right things here. And yes, you know, Obama's, Obama's now support of same-sex marriage is really going to energize these voters to come out and... Yeah. And vote for Romney. So while he's trying to stay, well, he do, he doesn't want to talk about he. I think he just doesn't want to talk about the same sex marriage thing because he knows that it's an issue that can play right. against him. But on the other hand, he's got these surrogates in in these positions like Tony Perkins, who are basically saying, you know, Ralph Reed coming out and saying like this is. I can't remember if it was Ralph Reed or Tony Perkins. One of them said that it was the greatest gift that Romney could have been yeah. given. Obama's support for same-sex marriage because this is going to energize all these voters. Well, um, or so, now Romney doesn't have to energize these, these even, you know. Obama right, did it exactly, because he was never really good at but talking did he? about Do you anyway. think he... So, you know, now if, if same-sex marriage was so important that you won't, you know, you'll vote on that issue, like Romney doesn't need to, like, make it an issue, right? I mean, I think that's the argument that a Tony Perkins would you know, could make or whatever. I think what was interesting was I thought maybe this moment at Liberty was, and you know, in this announcement with Obama was the first time that somebody like a Tony Perkins or Gary Bauer was able to say, okay, here's my reason that I can back Romney, you know, because like he's sort of the leftovers, right? Like once Santorum dropped out, I didn't see a whole bunch of conservative Christians, you know, running to endorse Romney. I think they were trying to look, they were looking for a reason to say, okay, finally, okay, fine. We'll, we'll back him. Okay, fine. You know, we'll devote some resources to whatever. And I think this, you know, in the last week or so, Obama's announcement, the Liberty Address sort of gave, gave them, kind of handed them the reason to say, okay, you know, fine, we'll, we'll do this or we'll do what we're going to do. And was it the Liberty Address itself? What, was it the substance no. of it or just the fact that he would go and speak? There? No, I mean, I don't, I don't think the substance really like floored anyone. Right. Like, I don't think anyone was surprised by any of it. Um, and then, mm -hmm. but, and I didn't, I was not particularly or personally surprised that he was going to Liberty itself. I think it just gave them like, say, let's say Tony Perkins constituents are having a hard time with Romney's campaign. Well, now he has a thing, you know, has a, a speech to point them to, has a, you know, Romney is trying to reach out to us. Now he, he Perkins, I don't think Perkins was ever going to not, you know, use, devote some resources to helping Romney. But I think now he's able to right. use this to say to his constituents, like, all right, here's what we, you know, what we needed or whatever. Ever since Santorum that dropped out, that is. But it's more of an anti, it's still more of an anti yes, yeah, yeah, ultimately <laughs> thing than it is a pro-Romney yeah, thing, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, speaking of Obama. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's, well, let's talk about that. But I wanted to talk about Obama, but I also wanted to talk about what you thought, do you think that it's really true that there's suddenly going to be this, this new energy infused into voters who might otherwise maybe would have stayed home? I mean, because I can't imagine that there's anybody out there who was thinking of voting for, or that many people, who was thinking of, who was going to vote right. for Obama. And who are no longer because. But then, who are no longer because of this. Because it seems to me that, from a policy perspective, he's already yeah, done, he's already done a lot of things, things to, to turn those voters off, right? The refusal to defend, his Justice Department's refusal to defend the Defense of Marriage Act in court. Don't ask, don't tell, repeal. There's a bunch of things uh, just on the on the LGBT issue right. alone that all would already would have made those voters so made those voters not want to vote for it. But here's so the thing: is, yeah. Do you think it's accurate that that there's suddenly going to be this huge yeah. flood of, people of who are gonna voters who are going to say now I'm now I'm definitely voting right. against it? Well, so here's here are a few things I think we you know some people have already mentioned, but you know we could bring up. Um, minority voters, you know, how are black pastors going to handle this going forward? Where in 08, it was so, uh, it seemed so easy for them to rally their base 
to get, you know, people to vote for Obama, and now it might be harder. Um, and not just black pastors, but, you know, in general, uh, Hispanic community, um, minority voters in general, like, it's unclear how it'll impact their vote or at least their public support of Obama. The other thing people have brought up, um, the voters in swing states, you know, will that make an impact in, say, like, North Carolina, where they just voted on that amendment. They just passed that ab amendment on, on uh, marriage. And so how is that going to impact in, in those certain states, Ohio, Wisconsin, et cetera? Um, oh, I had one other final group that I was going to bring up. Because, you know, like you said, I don't think, like, evangelicals were like, oh, now I'm not going to vote for Obama. Right. But I do right. think that in these sub you know subgroups that of people who – either in the in specific regions or certain you know race who would you know who want to vote for Obama but you know it's unclear to me whether that'll impact the activism for Obama if they'll have a harder time saying you know they may still vote for him in the end but will they you know do the whole you know hope change activism will they phone bank will they Will they canvas? Will exactly. They bring their Wait, to the right. Because I think that and could really, you know, if they're, if say a black pastor is, you know, saying certain things from the pulpit, but then he's saying, you know, on the weekends he's help, you know, or help helping people gather for Obama, it, it's going to be hard, I think, for, for them, you know, like you said, these Obama slowly has been slowly moving this way, but he wasn't really before 08 so it's unclear how it'll impact him in 12 this year right and i think the all of this is is calculations at the margins yeah. right so you're looking at states where it might yeah. be decided by a small number yeah. of votes and the electoral votes of that state are going to be determinative on the outcome and i think that there are some and i i guess i just don't have a measure because I'm not a, I'm not a pollster and I don't have, I'm not the number cruncher who has all of this at the ready, right? So, but I think that there's some thinking that Romney really needs to get the white evangelical vote pushed up above 80%, you know, like hovering in the mid seventies isn't going to cut it for some reason. Must be, you know, some calculation that's been made uh, about, uh, you know, what kind of, what kind of, uh, voter turnout and numbers and percentages really need to, that he, that Romney would really need to beat Obama in certain states. Um, and I think that for the people who are talking about the impact on uh, African-American or Latino pastors and their constituents, they're also thinking about this in terms of being at, at the margins, you know, can, is Obama going to get, you know, 90 or 95% of the African-American yeah. vote, thing, things like that. And so obviously these things can be, those numbers can be determinative, but I just feel like this issue isn't going to be because there are just so many other things happening and that are going to be on people's minds when they go to the polls. Yeah, sure. There are probably people for whom this is going to be yeah. the thing yeah. on their mind, but for a lot of for a lot of people, like you said, they've already decided they're not going to vote yeah. for Obama, and this didn't really change the equation for them. And you know, if you think that Obama is great on you know economic issues or immigration or foreign policy compared to Romney, or you know, if you think that the um, Republican Party is terrible on you know, cutting, cutting the budget and, and slashing the social safety net, you know, is Obama coming out in favor of same-sex marriage going to make you vote for the Republicans? It just sort of seems, well, especially, it I think it's important, especially because Obama said specifically, it's not a federal issue for him. If he had, that would have changed the equation, I think politically, because, you know, what is Obama going to do? And he got some criticism from the left for saying that it was something that should be left to the Wait. states. He got a lot of criticism. Right, that, that he didn't go far enough, I mean, right? I some. thought that was really interesting. But I, and that's that's one of the points I think um, a blog made last week was that Obama is not going to get involved in things like Proposition 8 or the North Carolina Amendment. He's not going to step in and change these laws that have already been passed. You know, it'll either stay at the uh, state legislative 
you know, in, in the state um, courts or in the in politics at the state level, Obama making these statements on same sex it, it, marriage is very symbolic, but it's not like it's going to, you know, make sweeping change on um, gay marriage and it's not like allowing gay, Amer gay marriage across the board. Um, so I think if he if it had been more of a federal federal um, issue, I think that would have been more of a political decision that people had will have you know have to make in November or whatever. But in right, it was interesting because because Jim Clyburn, um, the assistant um, minority leader in the mm -hmm. House, this morning came out and said that he thought it should be a federal right. issue that Obama was wrong for saying it was a state's issue, and so I guess that puts it out there that you know there are some Democrats who. Yeah. think that. Um, but I think that where Obama left it, politically yeah. speaking, it, he put himself in a place where he didn't have to say, he doesn't have to say anything yeah. more about it, right? So he basically said, this is a personal decision that I came to. Politically and legally, it should be left to the states. And that's it, right? I think the thing that's probably going to get talked about more than state versus yeah. federal is what he said about how his faith informed his decision. Yeah, because, I, I, so, yes, I agree <laughs> in that I think a lot of people were really interested, you know, and have been very interested in how he talks about his faith. And, and he's, I can't believe how much he talks about his faith. I can't, I can't believe nobody's talking about how much he talks about his faith. Um, and then to use... I think he talks about it too much, but... Yeah, what okay, I'm saying so. is, I, I, you know, if this had been Bush... He, people would be like, oh, my gosh, he's talking about his faith all the time. But, you know, you don't get a lot of coverage after the prayer breakfast or the Easter prayer breakfast of him, how much he talks about Jesus and, you know, personal Savior and things like that, that I'm like, whoa, this is, you know, practically, or if not very evangelical-type language. Evangelical, yes, yes. But, you know, it's interesting because, um, you know, so before last week, he talked about this in very – he talked about the same-sex marriage issue, not necessarily in evangelical right. terms, because I think that, that it's it's more of a conservative, ecumenically conservative way yeah. of framing it. He talked about it in terms of tradition. I think he used the term tra traditional marriage and between a man and a woman. And then last week, he says, well, yes, my faith did inform this decision. And I really started to think about it more in terms of the golden rule and treating everybody equally. Um and I think, you know, every religion reporter in the country, they're, you know, boy, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think for a lot of people, they weren't really thinking about it, that they weren't considering that piece of it that yeah. closely because it was just the announcement in and of itself was, was right. the big news. Uh, but what do you think, what do you make of him, A, using faith at all to justify the decision and then also just the way he framed that. It was very, you know, basic. It wasn't any deep no, theological analysis. No, it wasn't. I, well, so <laughs> Terry Mattingly, my um, boss at GetReligion.org would say, he's uh -huh. just in line with every other, I think he described, you know, liberal mainline Protestant um Christian, it's not you know like this is these are the arguments that they use in the mainline church and oh sorry and not all mainline churches but you know you'll hear this in the Episcopal Church or whatever and so what he's saying is not necessarily out of line with that. What I'm curious is how somebody I mean somebody like his, um, his spiritual advisor T.D. Jakes or Joel Hunter or Jim Wallace are, are going to have to uh, um, answer to their constituents and say, you know, how are they going to explain that faith element and, and what, what do we do about the golden rule? What, it, what do we do about these passages that he's citing? Or, um, you know, how do we think about that? Well, that doesn't really get discussed a lot, reconciling that with the idea that you know, but, but that's just a completely different framing, right? And I think that there are more complex theological discussions of, of human mm -hmm. sexuality and what the passages in the Bible that discuss uh, sexuality um, mean. I think that there is a kind of a more nuanced theological discussion that goes on among liberal theologians beyond just that the golden rule should apply and therefore there should be same-sex marriage because people... Um, you know, people should all be treated equally. 
uh, in the they're treated equally in the eyes of God, and they should be treated equally in the eyes right. of the law. Well, uh, you'll see the the argument too that no matter what I or my friend or my whatever feel about gay marriage or sorry about homosexuality itself as a you know sexuality whether it's nature or nurture or whatever whatever we believe about that how do we believe about the state's involvement in marriage what do we think about you know if you're more libertarian does that mean you know you may hold these views about homosexuality but well if you know if the, you don't want the government deciding you know xyz is marriage well what you know what does that do for how the government decides who's married no matter how you feel personally or theologically about sexuality i think you know you'll see different christians taking different views about how that plays out politically or you know from a policy standpoint right i think he didn't address he didn't say i no longer did he because i think he never said I, I don't think he ever said that he thought that homosexuality was a sin. No. He just had confined this to marriages between you a man mean and Obama? Woman. And yeah, no, yes. I, uh, yeah, I'd be interested to see if he would ever talk about sexuality. Because yeah, again, it's a very much like how does this play out in real life and how we decide how the state decides who's, you know, who's able to adopt. And oh, did you know? Sorry, not to go on a sidetrack note, but I didn't realize until last week until. Um, you know, some of the reports about it, that Romney is for, you know, is fine with gay, gay couples adopting children? Yes, but I, I, don't, I wonder how long he'll be able to get well, away with that. because isn't that, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but the whole argument, or one of the big arguments against gay marriage is that it has an impact on kids and society. And if Romney's saying, well, it's okay for gay couples to adopt, isn't that, like, going against the whole, like, argument against gay marriage? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, from, from a sort of just a question of the internal logic of it, yes, and also from a question of the opposition of the, the, opposition of the people that he, whose support he's seeking, their opposition to same-sex uh, unions yeah. or marriages extends adoption to well that's adoption one of the biggest question. reasons why they're you know at least that i you know people have told me like well we don't want gay marriage because then you know what will that do to kids and adoption and things like that well it seems like romney is already saying well gay, gay adoption's fine but you know forbid marriage well and it's interesting too because the the u.s conference of catholic bishops that has been one of their quote-unquote religious freedom arguments yeah. that in states where uh, charities same-sex adoptions were le made legal, that they they claimed that that forced them to shut down their uh, foster care and adoption services. Although I would argue that it was their choice to shut it down rather than comply with the law. Uh, well, regardless so of you know, it how definitely we... seems part and parcel of the of the argument of the anti-gay argument anti-gay marriage argument part and parcel of that is being opposed to same-sex adoption yeah that's too. why i was surprised to i so i you know did some digging and apparently this is not a, like a new position for romney but i i was surprised that that it seems like um possibly like you know some of the social conservatives back in 08 were concerned about mccain because he supports um embryonic stem cell research as an extension of you know life issues or whatever and this seems like an extension of um, gay marriage, possibly. But, I, you know, I don't see Tony Perkins or um, Gary Bauer mentioning this or bringing this up. But I wonder if, you know, if... Surely Brian Fisher's brought it up, though. That seems like right up his alley to bring it up. Brian Fisher? Know. Is that what you said? Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know anybody who listens to Brian Fisher. <laughs> I mean, I know people do, <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, the... Uh, <sighs> All right. Well, <laughs> can we talk about a little bit about, said about it? Better, right? About um, the pat. What I your argument I thought was interesting um, when you were saying. So you know, Obama after making this announcement had the New York Times has reported that he called Joe Hunter, he called Jim Wallace, he's, he's calling these pastors. What you were trying, I think, making the point was. 
for those who are really a new evangelical in the sense that, you know, they care about um, the environment or they care about um, poverty and these poverty, other issues, like, right. is gay marriage actually going to be an issue for them anyway? Um, or, or is it going to be, you know, one of the pr primary issues that, you know, they're going to vote on? Um, I thought that was an interesting point if, you know, if we're, like, how... How big of a swath do we think the the new evangelicals, the Rich Sizics, the Jim Wallaces, how, you know, how much do we think they make a, how percentage wise, what, you know, what, what do they make of evangelicals anyway? But um, I thought that was an interesting point. Well, you know, I was arguing also that Obama had sort of painted himself into a corner, so to speak, because he reach, you know, there are pro gay marriage pastors and religious leaders out there. There are lots of them. But are right? they going to reach the yeah, audience? You know, he, he knows, you know, they're going to vote for him anyway. Right. So he, what he was trying to do exactly. by surrounding himself with people like Jim Wallace and Joel Hunter and, and, um, other people who one might expect other, well, I don't even know that I would expect Jim Wallace to be a Republican, but you know, Joel Hunter, yes, you know, and, or yeah, at least they're willing Hunter. to, you know, hear both sides or whatever. Yeah. Right. I mean. And, and, and so, so now, but now he's in this position of like, okay, well now what do I do? Cause I've made these people my spiritual advisors, or that's the terminology that apparently someone in the white house wanted the press right. using, uh, that they were his spiritual yeah. advisors. And now he's done this thing that runs counter to what they believe. Right. So for someone like Joe Hunter, I mean, he's pretty, it's not like he's one of these people who's kind of on the right. fence and getting there about. No, he's not going to involve with Obama. <laughs> that's for sure. No, yeah, he's not involving. <laughs> he knows where he is and he's right. there, right? And uh, so, so yeah. So well, if I can push back, how are these relationships on that point? On that specific, I, okay. you know, I, I already said I enjoyed the point that you made earlier on the new evangelicals, but. You know, when you're describing yeah. these pastors like Jim Wallace, Joel Hunter, um, I thought actually it was smart on Obama's part to reach out to them because they are more likely to to say to their audience with credibility, okay, he may believe something different about same-sex marriage, but it's not on the priority list for us. Like, poverty is above that. Or, you know, they're able to say to an audience that may not otherwise vote for Obama or would struggle to, or, you know, have these, or, or maybe they'd, you know, maybe Jim Wallace's crowd would, you know, would go out and campaign for him. I'm not sure. But, um, but I thought, you know, from a strategic point of view, I thought it was, you know, it made sense for Obama to reach out to them and continue to, to explain to them when he has to do something like contraception, you know, the contraception mandate, he's going he's gonna to need Joel Hunter to explain to, you know, these people to calm them down or whatever, you know, whatever he has to do, Joel Hunter is going to have much more of an ability to bring that message than, you know, um, a Methodist pastor or, or, you know, a PCUSA pastor or whatever. They're just going to have a little bit more credibility because they can, they're willing to talk kind of on both sides to some extent. But I guess my question is, yeah, he has an audience and he has credibility, but how much are they listening? I mean, does it matter? Um, does it, ha does it actually have any kind of impact on his audience or, you know, maybe not his audience, like people sitting in yeah. his pews, but people who might otherwise listen to what he has to say on television or, or at a conference or something like that. I think um, it's going to have more of an impact than, you know, a pro um, gay marriage pastor. If on this particular issue, I think he's going to be able to say, look, it's not, let's, you, it's okay yeah, to vote. For exactly. Him anyway. I think, I think he's going to have the ability to say, look, I'm with you on this issue, but let's look beyond that or whatever, you know, however he's pitching it or so mm -hmm. one thing I was wondering yeah, I mean, was, I guess you know, why yeah. you um, describe them as anti-gay pastors instead of something like anti-gay rights or. Um... Well, you know, I think that it is anti-gay to be opposed to same-sex marriage and, and to say that, you know, people shouldn't have the same rights as everybody else. I mean, I think that it's a, 
it's a dodge to frame it in terms of religious freedom and say that, well, you know, this is the way the Bible intended it. And if we let gay people get married, then this infringes on our religious liberty. Um, I just, I think it's an anti-gay position to be anti-same-sex marriage and to try to get away with it by saying that this is what your religion requires and your religious freedom requires you to take that position and make sure that it's not quote unquote imposed on you. Even though same-sex marriage laws that have passed in state legislatures have exemptions that don't require, that are explicit about not requiring houses of worship to have to perform or otherwise participate in same-sex ceremonies uh, if it, it runs counter to their religious beliefs. So I think that those protections are sufficient. You know, nobody is going to make, I mean, nobody makes a, um, you know, nobody makes a rabbi perform an interfaith uh, wedding ceremony. You know, you know, the state is not going to come in and say, oh, well, this, you know, Jewish woman and a Christian man came and said that they wanted you to marry them, but you can't do it because you won't do it because both of them aren't Jewish. The state doesn't make them do it. So I think that there's a lot of, you know, scare tactics around the idea that uh, somehow this is going to force people, force religious people to act contrary to their religious. Well, beliefs. regardless of, you know, whether people are using this to you know, say whatever about religious freedom. It just seems like adding something like, again, anti-gay rights or anti-gay marriage or whatever would add a little bit more specificity to what is Joel Hunter, you know, because I'm sure Joel Hunter has gay congregants in his, in his um, congregation, you know, who he probably talks to and probably has relationships with them and uh, friendships with them and, um, if that makes sense. I, I guess I felt like, you know, sort of uh, similar to the calling a, someone who's um, pro-choice or against uh, or for legalization of abortion, like, you know, the, the way we talk about how, you know, how we frame it is interesting. You know, do we call them anti-choicers mm -hmm. because that's the issue, whether it's a choice or not, or do we call it um, you know, specifically opposed to a, a criminalizing abortion or, or however you, you know, say it, but, um, yeah, anyway, that's the choice, you know. Yeah, no, I, 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 I hear your point. I hear your point, but, uh, yeah, like I, I already yes, explained yes. what my thinking right. was on that. So, um, well, so let's, let's finish up with just a discussion about this idea that the, um, views on same-sex marriage are kind of generational, yes. that it's older voters who are against it and younger voters who are yeah. fine with it. Uh, is that, and I think that that's been, that's been shown by polling data, with, you know, just kind of across the board when it's not broken down um, by religion or race. If you just look at it broadly, just by age groupings, it's, I can't remember what the differences are, but they're stark and they're, they're huge. Uh, uh, I, yeah. so we, Tobin Grant and I did a piece for Christianity Today, especially looking at evangelical attitudes towards same sex marriage, but we also compared it to the, you know, uh, mm -hmm. not born again category. And um, right. from this graph, it looks like opposition to same sex marriage among 18 to 35 year olds who are not born again is 12%. I mean, that is really low. Wow. Right? And then yeah. you compare that to people who self describe as born again and who are 18 mm -hmm. to 35 and that's at 44 percent so you know there's a pretty different age of gap to it. or sorry not age gap mm -hmm. but um if you are born again obviously it's going to make a huge difference um, right on your views on same-sex marriage and then also if you if you take that extend that even further if you're 36 or over you are 63% chance of being against same-sex marriage, which is um, compared to... Regardless of your religion. No, no, this is born-again. Uh, oh. Born-again oh, believers okay. Okay. are 63% uh -huh. opposed to gay marriage. And this is according to the General Social, Social Survey. And we explained in mm -hmm. the piece how you ask about gay marriage really makes a difference with the poll data. Right. So you can have like a 12-point right. swing depending on how you... If you ask gay marriage as a, if you phrase it as sort of a right, it's going to be very different from if you phrase it as 
should states allow gays to marry or something, you know, something like that. Um, so people are more in favor of it if you frame it as a exactly. right, as a, like a civil right issue. That's Very interesting. Much so. Yeah. Yeah. And then hmm. if you are not born again you, and you're 36 or over, you are 38% of those are opposed to same-sex marriage. So again, you know, religion right. has a big, big um, mm -hmm. part of this. And what we also thought was interesting was, you know, obviously people said a lot for a long time, like we're shifting generation, um, you know, in the last 10, 20 years where we're seeing this huge shift. In 1988, born again believers, opposition to same-sex marriage was at 85% compared to now it's like 60 Sixty-four percent is what, or sixty-three percent is what I said, compared to now. You know, it's um, or even two years ago it was at sixty percent. And then if if you well, were so not born again in nineteen eighty-eight, you were opposed to same-sex marriage at the same level that evangelicals are today. So, hmm. so, so there's been these big changes in the non-evangelical population. Oh, huge. Yeah. Will there come a point, huge yeah. changes, right? Will there come a point where the evangelical, and obviously, you know, it's not monolithic mm -hmm. that, so you're saying 44% of born again uh, respondents who were between the ages of 18 and 35, 44% of them were opposed to same sex marriage. So it's not even a majority. It's, you know, it's shrinking down it to a, a sizable yeah. minority, right? But sizable. Will there come a point where, I mean, do you see a rift within evangelicalism where there will be, you know, this, what, where what will remain 10 years from now are inclusive, LGBT inclusive churches like Jay Baker's? Well, does, I is, mean, would example. other evangelicals see Jay Baker's church as evangelical? <laughs> well, there's that question. Okay, let's take a different question. Um, so, but, but do you think that there will be, a noticeable split where evangelicals will no longer be as uh, unified on this issue as they once were. I mean, with any cultural change, I think we will see some differences. The question I have is whether it'll be like, you know, if you're, say, LGBT friendly or however you want to put that, are you just going to switch over to the mainline church or is your church going to adapt with those changes? You know, does that make sense? Like, are you just going to become? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess that's maybe more yeah. my question. Is it, are there going to be churches who adapt to the changes or the pressure, the pressure to not be LGBT inclusive be too intense? Yeah. I wish I could tell you the answer to that because, you know, yeah. 30 years ago, did people think that evangelical churches would allow um, women's ordination. I, you know, a lot of, a lot of churches still don't, and right? Some still don't. You know? So, right, I mean, right. the Southern Baptist mm -hmm. Convention is what the third largest religious denomination in the country. And I don't right. see the Southern Baptist changing anytime soon. You know, if anything, mm -hmm. they will be right. the last stronghold. Right. <laughs> um, right. so, uh, you know, I, I do see a coming, um, you know, if not generational, but maybe cultural, I don't know if there will be a year where, you know, we'll see just, it's too obviously split down the middle. You know, it's unclear. Will churches split over this? I'm, you know, they already have, right, within the Episcopal Church. And will we see that within evangelicalism? I don't, I don't know that it's going to be as obvious as it was with the mainline Because church. there aren't the denominations. I think that within, you know, the Episcopal mm -hmm. Church and, within, you know, there's the, there was the, um, fight that went on within uh, the Met United right. Methodist Church at their right. convention recently about whether to take the, yeah, the language out of their book of mm -hmm. discipline that says that uh, homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching, and they voted not to take it out. So it's still mm -hmm. in there, and there's, you know, sort of an ongoing battle over that. But, you know, the, the evangelical world, I mean, apart from some, there are some denominations, but a lot of the evangelical churches are non -denominational. Exactly. That's so why I think it won't what be. What kind of split would there be? I think it won't be yeah. as obvious as it was with the mainline churches because we, evangelical churches, you know, they don't even own their own buildings a lot of times or they, you know, they're like renting out schools. So it's not like they're going to have this big court battle over, you know, I, but what I am curious is how will it affect the mega churches, you know? Like that, that's one thing that I think will be key. How will, 
you know, Rick mm-hmm. Warren's church have to adapt or will it adapt or, you know, what will it do? Yeah. And did you, did you happen to see the, the buzz about Andy Stanley? Um, he's a pastor in Atlanta. Yeah, I don't. Know who, okay. I know who he is, but I didn't. So hear this this little buzz is a recent sermon illustration he gave. My understanding is that he specifically pointed out like a divorced couple and a gay couple, and he didn't you know go out of his way to sort of condemn this gay couple. And so people like Al Mohler, um, Denny Burke, they're they're kind of chastising him, saying he's not being explicit enough, not speaking on homosexuality enough. And, you know, who Andy Stanley, to my knowledge, has not really addressed their concerns. And so, you know, this isn't, you know, this is a question of mega churches and how they try to reach out to as many people as possible, but also, you know, as Mueller, as Mueller might say, stand their ground on these issues. Yeah. <laughs> Do you see a coming battle or a coming... I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like that it could just be a question of alienating younger, if there's too much focus or talk of this, that it would alienate um, the pro same-sex marriage yeah. people in the churches to go to a different church if there was, you know, so it might make the possibility of inclusive churches more possible if there's more demand for them, right? Or it might just turn them off to church at, at all, and they might just, you know, not go sure. or do Bible study with some friends or, you know, that sort right. of thing. One thing that I think we can't forget is the issue of abortion, right? Like, the population right. is going more, uh, Gallup wording, I think, is per, per, more self-identifying as pro-life or whatever. I think a lot of, you know, a lot of evangelicals might even consider, who, who feel a certain way on gay marriage or on LGBT issues might consider the Episcopal Church, but they may not be able to bring themselves because of how the pastor stands on abortion or whatever. So that's, I think, combining those two issues are fascinating. I know, you know, people say, oh, evangelicals are more about those two issues, but more than just those two issues. But I think those, for a lot of people, you know, say a lot about marriage, life, ethics, you know, those kinds of things that, you know, can you... Can you pick one, you know, take one side on one and a different side on the other and find a church that agrees, you know, with your particular point of view on those? Yeah, that's that's another question. I mean, you know, and and related to our discussion before about whether having somebody like Joel Hunter talking on on Obama's behalf is actually helpful. You know, in a previous um, blogging heads, I had Matt Anderson, who blogs at Orthodoxy, Mm -hmm. talking about talking about this and. You know, he was saying, I say, well, you know, are there deal breakers for younger yeah. evangelicals voting for a Democrat like yeah. Obama? And I said, you know, well, what about abortion? And he said, yeah, you can stop right there. Yeah. That's it. Right. And so in a way, you know, the, the whole same sex marriage thing doesn't matter because it, it, in that sense. In yeah, that it's not it's it's not going to like electoral change. Like, sense. all of a sudden people are going to, you know, necessarily go one way or the other because they may have felt this way about. Obama's views on abortion anyway. Right. Right. So, well, this is fun. Thank you. (laughs) It's fun to talk to you. Thanks for doing it. Talk to you later. Okay.